Mais aussi le tout des demi-espagnols. Mais aussi le tout des demi-espagnols. Euh, vamos a empezar ahora mismo con la, la ponencia del profesor Patrick McKeever, eh, director, eh, director de la División de Ciencias de la Tierra de la UNESCO, y que va a presentarnos una introducción general sobre los eh, geoparques. Patrick, ¿no? So, uh, my name is Patrick McKeever, I'm head of Earth Science at UNESCO and in charge of the global geopark activities at UNESCO. Um, before I start, I want to introduce you to the colleagues of the Global Geoparks Network so you know who, who they are. Guy Martini from the Global Geopark Haute Provence in France. Arthur Sa from the Global Geopark Aruca in Portugal, Martina Pascova, Global Geopark Sheskirai, uh, Czech Republic, Christine Rongnes, Global Geopark Genervegica of Norway, and I don't see my colleagues of the Grotas del Palacio, Geopark of Uruguay, maybe they're having a smoke, I don't know. But that's everybody, so, so it's just who you know. And uh, of course, uh, Luis Alcala from the Global Geopark of Mastazgo in Spain. And we also have uh, Pablo Rivas also from Spain. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll get through my talk. Um, just to explain to you a little bit about UNESCO. UNESCO and Nicolas Zuros from <laughs> Lesbos Global Geopark Greece. <laughs> Sorry, Nicolas. Um, UNESCO is the United Nations organization charged with education, science and culture. UNESCO this year celebrates 70 years in existence. And if you think back, what happened 70 years ago? It was 1945. It was the end of the Second World War. And the countries got together to create an organization with a very simple remit to build peace in the hearts of men and women. And today that's still the remit of UNESCO. And as I'll explain to you, the Global Geoparks and this Global Geoparks Network fit perfectly into that original remit of UNESCO to build peace in the hearts of men and women. Our headquarters are in Paris and uh, we also have regional offices. So I want to introduce to you Denise Garfinkel from UNESCO Montevideo and Jorge Ellis from UNESCO Quito. I suppose for most people, they know UNESCO because of our heritage listing. Uh, one of the, we're really the only United Nations organization that designates sites around the world uh, for protection. This has been done for the last uh, over 40 years through two labels, the World Heritage Label and the Man and Biosphere Programme. Global geoparks are not an official label of UNESCO yet, but they are and have been an official uh, part of the work program of, uh, of my section in Earth Science for over 10 years. So just to give you a little run through on the current status of the two official designations of UNESCO and the global geoparks. You can see here there are over 1,000 world, world Heritage Sites. Of these, uh, less than 20% uh, are what we would call natural sites. So these are World Heritage Sites because of their, primarily because of their biodiversity, but also because of their geodiversity as well. And this also includes what we call cultural landscapes. The Man and Biosphere Programme has 631 biosphere reserves. And Global Geoparks, which is now 11 years old, has 111 global geoparks. This is an example from China of a geological world heritage site, the Zhenjiang Fossil Site. It doesn't look very, very much, it's not very scenic. But when you look at the rocks, you get these incredible fossils that come from that period of time at the base of the Cambrian, when life on Earth exploded into huge diversity for the very first time. So this is a very, very special site 
in terms of its geological heritage. If we look a bit closer at the World Heritage uh, label itself, because I'm doing this to explain to you why UNESCO is doing geoparks. So let's have a look at some statistics for you. 191 countries have signed the World Heritage Convention. Now that's a fundamental difference to how global geoparks work. So these countries sign a convention and only then do they start making World Heritage sites. It's a very top-down initiative, I guess you could call it. I mentioned that less than 20% of these sites are natural sites. But if we look further into the World Heritage, this criterion 8 is the geological criterion. It's under this that sites of geological interest can become World Heritage. Only 88 are there because of geology, but not just geology. They also have one other uh, criterion, and that could be biodiversity. Um, only 18, 18 out of 1,007, 18 World Heritage Sites are there simply because of geology. Now you think about that. Our planet, 4,600 million years of history, of memory, of heritage, and yet only 18 sites on the World Heritage List. So something must be wrong there. Less than 2%. And I'll illustrate this with this photograph. Probably the most iconic volcano in the world, Mount Fuji. It was inscribed on the World Heritage List two years ago. Not at all because of geology, but because of its cultural and religious significance to the Japanese people. And I'll show you some more statistics about overlap within UNESCO, because that could be a concern too. Um, within the 197 natural world heritage sites, over half of them are also biosphere reserves. So big overlap. But only 11 are global geoparks. Uh, and of the 11, only two of these uh, natural world heritage, world heritage sites are actually geological. And that's in Jeju in Korea and in Germany, the Messel Pit. Eight out of 631 biospheres are also global geoparks. So it's just to illustrate that there's no danger of geoparks duplicating what already exists in UNESCO's listings. So what is a global geopark? That's what we're here to find out. It's very simple. It's an area not a site, it's an area of geological heritage of international significance. And I'll explain what that means later. But as I was explaining yesterday to some of the colleagues, even it, if, even it is the most important geological heritage in the world, the most fabulous iconic site in the world, unless it involves local communities, unless the local communities are really taking charge of the area, then it cannot be a global geopark. These two things fundamentally must go together. You cannot have one without the other. And is it just about geology? Well, no, it's not. Um, as a geologist, I would always point out how, how much geology has influenced who we are as a human race, as society, in terms of our culture, in terms of, of how we build, in terms of construction, geology is really at the centre of who we are as, 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 a, as a species. And that's what we try to celebrate in a geopark. We look to see how this geological heritage uh, has shaped our natural, cultural and intangible heritages. And I know right across Central and, and Latin America with the great chain of volcanoes and the stories that are attached to those. In my own country, our own Iconic geological sites such as the Giants Causeway, um, who was the giant, that's what people ask, rather than how did those rocks form. And it's about bringing these things together that, that we celebrate uh, a, ge a geopark. And it's also important at this, at this point just to point out global geoparks are not protected areas. They're not national parks. They're not some kind of geological reserve. The Global Geopark is a label, 
not a designation, is a promotional label to help empower local people. However, having said that, the main geological sites, those main key sites inside a geopark, should have uh, some kind of legal protection, but it doesn't have to be at national level. It can be at the local level or even following the indigenous practice. So it's quite an open uh, method to protect the sites inside a, a geopark. This photograph is from Yandangshan, Global Geopark in China. And if you look closely, you can see these lines going across. These are walkways made of rope. The community who lived here found this fantastic cliff face so impressive that they thought there must be something very special about it. And they would walk up along these walkways to bury their dead, hang them from coffins on this amazing cliff because they thought there's something special, something sacred about the earth here. And this is the kind of thing that we celebrate in geoparks. A brief history of, of geoparks so you know where we all come from. Um, I think it was in October, November 2000 that uh, four, four areas in Europe uh, made a conference and asked uh, uh, people from across the rest of Europe to come down to, to Mastrasgo in Spain, where we heard about this idea of geopark. Um, little did we know, four years later uh, in UNESCO, that uh, UNESCO would create a global geoparks network by bringing together existing geoparks in Europe and those geoparks that existed in China. Uh, in June 2004, we had the first uh, geoparks conference, the first global geoparks conference in Beijing. They've then since been held in Belfast, Osnabrück, Lankawi, Shimabara, and last September, St. John, New Brunswick in Canada. Today, the GGN has 111 members in 32 countries across five continents. And here are the geoparks. The yellow ones are the new members from last year. Um, uh, 64 of them are here in Europe, a great concentration in Europe, a great concentration also in Eastern Asia. But the reason we're here today is because there's not so much happening down here. We're delighted to have Arripe in Brazil, delighted to have Uruguay, Greta del Palacio, Tumblr Ridge in British Columbia, and Stonehammer in New Brunswick. But a big empty space here, and yet we know there's a great interest in geological heritage here, a huge geodiversity. Um, a great link between that geodiversity and the cultures of, of the different regions. And that's why we're here, is to try to encourage the development and appreciation of global geoparks in, in Latin America. How does the geoparks work? How do you become a global geopark? Well, there's a nomination file that has to be prepared and submitted to UNESCO. The details of that are on the UNESCO website. And if anybody wants to know uh, further about that, they can just contact me and I'll send you the details of that. Um, once we receive your application dossier, we send the geological part, which is section B, we send the geological part to the International Union of Geological Sciences. And they're the organization that will tell us if your geological heritage is of international value or not. Now, unlike World Heritage, which is looking for something called Outstanding Universal Value, in a global geopark, we're looking for international value. So we want to know from academics that this area is really important on a global level, that it's been subject to international geological research, for example. So that's what we mean by that. After that's done, oh, sorry, after that's done, then we organize a field evaluation mission and immediately after this workshop, the field evaluation mission to Imbabura in Ecuador will be taking place. Uh, once that's finished, a report is submitted to the Global Geoparks Bureau and they'll be meeting in September this year in Japan to decide whether a nomination will be accepted, deferred or rejected. If an application is accepted, Unlike biospheres and unlike world heritage, it's only for four years. So you only become a global geopark for four years. After that, you're subject to this process once again. And two experts will revisit your area and check that everything is as, as it should be, 
check that the community are really involved, check that uh, economic impact is actually happening, that there is a real story to be told there, that jobs are actually being created. And what can happen is that if the experts feel that not enough progress has been made, they'll only renew your membership for two years. We call this the yellow card. Um, after the two years, then they will go back again and check. And if, again, if the progress is not sufficient, then you get, unfortunately, the red card. And that means that you will lose your membership of the Global Geoparks Network. So it's a very rigorous, it's a very strict quality control process. And uh, the Ge Global Geoparks are not shy of using these cards. So there are several geoparks at the moment on yellow cards. And uh, over the last 11 years, um, I think about half a dozen or so have, have received the red card. So it does happen, unfortunately. This is a very special geopark in Indonesia. It's on the island of Bali. And this is a volcano, Mount Batur. You can see a recent lava flow here. I could show you another creepy picture involving dead people like the one I did from China. The reason is because the lava coming down of this volcano decomposes in the tropical climate to give a special type of soil. A special type of soil allows a particular type of tree to grow, a tree which has a very strong fragrance and which the local people for centuries have buried their dead under in the open, not in a hole in the ground. They just put the body underneath the tree, decompose naturally. And again, it's a link between the intangible heritage of those people and the very active geological heritage of this part of Indonesia. This year, we have, um, I think, 17 or 18 new applications to become global geoparks. I'll just show you, this is the list, and for the first time, we have applications from Bulgaria, from Belgium, from Ecuador, uh, from Lebanon, and from Cyprus. So, as I mentioned, uh, right after this, this, uh, this workshop, the mission to Imbabura will be happening. And across the coming months, missions to all these uh, geoparks will be happening. But not just these ones. Also this list. We have 24 global geoparks this year that are going to be going through the four-year revalidation process. Guy's Geopark is going to be revalidated this year. Uh, Luis Alcala, his geopark also is due for revalidation this year. And uh, a great list right the whole way down. So a busy summer for the members of the Global Geopark Network who will be doing these various missions. I want now to talk just a little bit about some of the activities in, in Global Geoparks. In particular, uh, just three areas that, that we in UNESCO are very much in favour of the Global Geoparks exploring a little bit more. Global Geoparks, they, they hold the past record of climate change. In the rocks of the geoparks, the rocks that are millions of years old, tell a story of the past climates that have existed on the earth. And remember, um, you know, at times in the, in the geological past, our earth has been almost totally covered in ice. And at times in the past, it's been more or less free of ice. So a huge variation in climate. Geoparks hold the record of this. And they can help us inform our communities about the challenges we may face now regarding climate change. Many global geoparks, indeed such as any that might develop in, in uh, Mexico, are in active areas of the world where communities face real, real problems with geological hazards such as volcanic eruptions, uh, earthquakes and tsunami. And this is uh, from the Catholic Global Geopark of Iceland. You can see this dramatic line of volcanic cones. This is a very famous Lacagiger fissure. In 1781, this erupted without warning. And even today, this is the biggest volcanic eruption in human history in the terms of the amount of lava that was erupted. So much lava and so much gas was erupted, it poisoned the atmosphere of Iceland and led the colonial power at the time, which was Denmark, to actively consider just evacuating the whole country totally and leave Iceland uninhabited. Iceland is a big place, so this was a serious eruption. 
It caused famine across much of Europe for two or three years. And yet this happened just over 200 years ago. This could happen today and it could have the same effect. But look how much different Northern Europe is now. And look at how many more people would be affected should an eruption of that scale happen today in Iceland. So it's very important that we keep these things in mind within our geoparks. Many of our global geoparks are in former mining areas, areas that maybe where the landscape has been altered, some could say devastated by mining activities. But without mining, we won't have the society we are today. I always make a point of, at this point of showing this, and everybody wants to have their smartphone. Well, unless you mine and quarry, you aren't going to have one. You know, we have to take stuff out of the ground. So we have to have a balance and we have to work with our mining industry to encourage them to do mining in a more responsible way, a more sustainable way, and in a way that can benefit local communities. And many of our geoparks are in that situation. But most importantly, geoparks are about people. And I want to introduce you to some of the people of our global geoparks. Geoparks take community participation beyond, to another step. It's not just something we talk about. It's something we insist on. It's something that forms part of this revalidation process. Unless we see local people really involved, really making, uh, getting involved in the geopark, then it's a problem. We want to build that sense of ownership, that sense of empowerment, that sense of pride. And we consider global geopark communities really as the ambassadors of their territory. Sure, as a geologist from a former, ge well, former geologist from a geological survey, I can go to a community and make them aware they live somewhere special. But you know, they'll know that anyway. They don't need a geologist to tell them. They'll know they live somewhere special. Global geoparks use the reflection of the territory's earth heritage in the traditions, the local tales, the songs. And of course, we also encourage academic research. It's about all of these things together. But I'll just introduce you to some people here. These are two ladies from the Jeju Global Geopark Republic of Korea. That's South Korea. Now, this lady here, I met her just last month. She dropped out of school when she was about 12 or 13. She couldn't, you know, just barely read and write. She had no... no um, ability to learn in school. For most of her life, she stayed at home, raising her family. And then about eight years ago, Jeju became a global geopark. And she wondered about that. Well, what is this global geopark? And she asked about it, and she found out that she could be involved in it. And she knew many stories about the part of Jeju Island that she lives in. Today, she earns a living, a good living, as a tour guide, a geopark ambassador on Jeju. The geopark has changed this woman's life so much, she wants to go to university to do a degree in geology. And she even has a dream to become a doctor of geology one day. For somebody who dropped out of school, that's the power the geopark can make. This lady here, it's a similar story. For most of her life, she has sold dried squid to visitors. Just made a few a few dollars a day doing that and she has followed the same path she's now a guide for the JG geopark and is really the, these people are so passionate you can't imagine it's made such a difference to their lives i'm going to stay in asia and i'm going to go over to japan to the maruto global geopark and introduce you to this old lady who invites visitors into her home to explain to them what happened when the tsunami last hit the Maruto area of Japan. She wants to keep the story alive, pass it down to generations so they don't forget, so they remain alert, so they know that water once came right up to this woman's house. She's the photograph, she's the newspaper cuttings, and she has made it her life's for the remainder of her life, her work, to keep that story alive. And it's important because I was in Sendai in March this year, the area hit by the tsunami in 2011. And there, all the people want to do is forget, forget that it happened. 
But it's dangerous to do that. You have to keep these, these stories alive. Staying in Japan, but very much further north of Japan now, this is the Toya Usu Global Geopark. And this is um, a lady who's become, she's a member of the local community, just like the two Korean ladies I showed you. She's now what we call a volcano meister. And she goes around schools and around the community, community um, uh, halls and explains the risk of volcanic eruptions in this part of Japan and explains what they need to do and what happened last time. And again, she, she unlike in Korea, she's doing this on a voluntary, on a voluntary basis because she finds it so important. This lady has become empowered. That's what we mean. She's made a difference to her life. And of course, I have to show you the geopark people of my own country also. Can't help it. So this is the Copper Coast Global Geopark in Southeast Ireland. And all these people here may to you look like ordinary, ordinary European, white Europeans. They're not. In Ireland, we're one of the few countries in Europe to have an indigenous population. We call them the Irish traveller community. They've been much discriminated against, much, much um, not, not liked. There's a lot of, uh, get a lot of bad press. And I can show you that, and I'm not going to show you who they are. But this photograph includes people of what we call the Irish settled community and the Irish travelling community. And they're celebrating the opening of a new geopark visitor centre. And this man is the Prime Minister of Ireland. And he came down to share the celebration with them. So that's the power that a geopark can make to a very small rural community in Ireland. Geoparks, of course, are about communicating geoscience. But we don't have to do it by giving academic lectures. We can do it by getting kids involved, getting their hands dirty, explaining them the earth, how earth works, the earth processes, by making it fun for them. <coughs> A geopark ranger, another local person from the Bergstrasse Odenwald Global Geopark of Germany, who's a tour guide, who's making money, and who has been trained um, with some basic knowledge, knowledge of geology, but has all her own knowledge of her own area, the history of her own area. And tourists, of course, find that much more valuable. They're getting the authentic story. Serving and protecting our geodiversity is very important. This is the Zigong Global Geopark of China with this uh, fossil of a dinosaur. And rather than move the dinosaur from where nature intended it to a museum in Beijing, they built the museum over the site and kept the fossil in the place nature intended it to be. The Lesbos Island Global Geopark of Greece, where the Greek government are financing a new road from uh, across the island of Lesbos and as the new road has been excavated, they have uncovered thousands of petrified trees, all being meticulously uh, annotated and conserved. And uh, my colleague Nicholas Zuras, I'm sure, will tell you more about this amazing activity on Lesbos in his presentation. Colleagues of Greta Sil Palacio will remember this. This is, I have to tell you guys, this is one of the most special geopark events I was ever had the privilege of attending. This was during the evaluation mission for Grutus del Palacio in Uruguay. And these kids, you know, in your Uruguay, they have the, the little laptops. All the children have a little laptop. And these kids had to do a project on what is a geopark. And they presented, not just to me, I was just in the audience, they presented to the Minister of Education for Uruguay to the Minister of Environment for Uruguay, from the senior civil servant from the Ministry of Tourism of Uruguay. They had confidence, they had pride in their own area in Flores. And I thought that was very, very special. The new generation really getting to, to, to do a job like that. And the same thing in China here in Sangqingshan. The same thing happens, of course, there also. Uh, we talk sometimes about geotourism. Geotourism is a way of promoting sustainable development in, in some European countries. It may not be appropriate for other parts of the world to develop geotourism. But this is the Massif de Bouges in, in France. 
and this lady, uh, a Moroccan colleague, um, is on an electric bicycle. Electric bicycles are fantastic. You don't have to pedal. It's great, you know. So, you want to lose weight, it's not so good, but you know. And you can see she's fitted with this helmet and this strange device here. This is a, you know, like electronic gadgets gone, gone wild. Um, as she's traveling along, she's got headphones on, and as she's traveling along, she'll pass some marker in the road which sends a signal and tells her about the landscape she's looking at, tells her about how the farming works, and tells her all about the, this area of the Massif de Bouge in France. It's a really, really cool thing. And uh, nearby in the Haute-Provence Global Geopark in France, um, they have done a wonderful project many years ago with bringing in some of the world's most famous uh, sculptures and explaining to them the geological heritage and then just letting these artists interpret in their own way what's special. You can see here layer, layers of rock that are vertical, layers of rock that were once horizontal on a sea floor. How did they become vertical? And Andy Goldsworthy has placed a sentinel of time in front of them to draw your attention, to stop you when you're passing, to look and think, why are these rocks like this? What could have happened? So it's a very nice way of bringing science and art together. Arthur, it's not working. It is, there we go. And finally, I'll go back to geohazards again, the volcanoes of Java in Indonesia. And back to Japan, where they always have the most amazing geopark guides. And this, this lady here is explaining the process of what happens when there's an earthquake just offshore and the sea floor is suddenly shunted up, a huge volume of water is, place, is displaced, and a tsunami comes sweeping uh, onshore into Japan. And I'll stick with geohazards. This is a, a sign from many of the information boards in one of the geoparks in Japan after an earthquake run to higher ground. Um, but it's not just in Japan that they raise awareness of geohazards. There was a project between some of our geoparks in, in Europe um, to raise awareness, um, especially amongst children. We wanted to know psychologically what happens to children when you start talking to them about the risk of volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunami. What goes on in the kid's head? We have to do it very carefully that we don't cause some psychological damage to children. So this very interesting project wasn't just involving geologists and geoparks, it involved psychologists. It involved uh, doctors and medical staff from the main hospital of Athens uh, to look at, these, uh, look at these particular issues. I talked about the Volcan Volcano Meister program in Toya Usu, and here are some of them being trained. They're looking at a, a site uh, that was destroyed in the last volcanic eruption. You can see here an old people's home, which was destroyed in that eruption just uh, less than 10 years ago. Here they are again. And I just, just to go back to that, um, to get more than 23 people in this area have been trained as volcano meisters in a relatively small global geopark. So it's a very important initiative in these areas that are so prone to geological hazards. Not just in areas that are tectonically active. For example, this is the Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark in Ireland, an area where we don't have any geological hazards as far as we know. But in the visitor centre of the geopark, they have a little seismograph. And it's interesting that whenever uh, there's a big earthquake anywhere in the world, the local school children come into the visitor centre and they can see on this trace that the earth beneath the, the geopark in Ireland, it also moved. They also felt the shake. And it's important to build that awareness we all live on the one planet, that we're all affected by these, these, effect, the, these events. So it's an important thing to, to do. Um, this is the uh, Catalog Global Geopark of Iceland. This is the Vatna Jökull ice cap. And what can happen here is sometimes you can have a volcanic eruption beneath this ice cap. And when that happens, huge volumes of water can melt and can cause a devastating flood. 
And so one of the things they have to do in the Catlow Global Geopark is to make people aware of it. This is a small hotel in the small village of Vic, south coast of Iceland. This is the only, behind it, the only road in and out. And they know that when the Catlow volcano erupts, they've got about five minutes to get out of there before a devastating flood comes down. So it's very important to keep communities aware. Now I want to talk a little bit about politics and what's happening in UNESCO. Um, as I mentioned, global geoparks are not currently an official UNESCO label, but that could change very soon. Um, just over two years ago, uh, the executive board of UNESCO established a working group in geoparks. And over the last two years, they met actually seven times and they discussed if UNESCO should formalize the link to global geoparks and if it should, how would you do it? How would we make a label called UNESCO Global G? So agreement has been reached on that this could be done by, by a reform of the existing International Geoscience Program. The International Geoscience Program is a very important scientific program. It promotes uh, cooperation between scientists across the world. This is uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where young people, children, are panning for gold using all sorts of lethal uh, chemicals that's damaging not just their health, but damaging the groundwater. So we want to try to bring the scientific IGCP and the geoparks together to create a new program of UNESCO called the International Geoscience and Geoparks Programme. So when I give this, or a version of this presentation in Canada last September, there were various steps that had to be done. So let's see where we are today. We had to get the GGN, that is General Assembly, to agree that the Global Geoparks should become a legal NGO. Done. In October, we had to get the Executive Board of UNESCO to be made aware of these and to ask that the next step uh, of drawing up statutes should be taken. So the Executive Board agreed. We then drafted the statutes and guidelines for the UNESCO Global Geoparks. And that was done at a meeting, it was actually in January 2015. Done. We then had to get our partners, the International Union of Geological Sciences, to agree to the change of IGCP. They did that. The scientific board of IGCP agreed to the changes also. The final document, the final statutes and guidelines were then presented to the Executive Board of UNESCO last month. Agreed that. And so one more step needs to be done. And that happens in November when all 194 countries of UNESCO have to vote on whether to create the, for, the, for the first one for over 40 years, the first new site designation of UNESCO. Not, remember, this hasn't been done since 1972 and that was World Heritage. How will all this operate? Um, there'll be changes, so the, geo, the Global Geoparks Bureau will disappear. It'll be replaced by the UNESCO Geoparks Council with a, a body up here called the UNESCO Geoparks Bureau. But all final decisions in the future regarding who becomes a Global Geopark will actually be endorsed by the Executive Board of UNESCO rather than the GGN Bureau. Some, some changes are happening. The timescale of application will also change. So although we will accept applications as usual between October and November, it's going to be a year and a half before the final endorsement of, exec of the Executive Board of UNESCO will come. So it'll be a longer process. And what happens to the existing global geoparks, to the 111? Now, I know that those existing global geoparks here today will have received emails from my colleague, Margaret Patsack, looking for various bits of information. So we need from you a detailed map of your geopark, shape file if, if you have it, and summary description. And you will also need to send me a letter of support from your national commission to UNESCO or the relevant government body in charge of relations with UNESCO in your country. So I'll need a letter from them to say that your country approves 
that the existing Global Geopark can be uh, transformed into a UNESCO Global Geopark. That could also happen from, for Imbabura also if it is approved this September. But for the future, and I guess that's what we're talking about here mostly, the change of process will be that ahead of any uh, application, new application from Latin America, we will now need a letter of intent. So this is an expression of interest. And again, that must government body in charge of relationships with UNESCO. And the application should all, must also have this very same endorsement. So these are part of the new guidelines that, that I'm showing you. Um, other than that, the process remains pretty much the same. The actual core application will remain the same. So this is a very strong victory, I think, for the philosophy and for the work of the geoparks over the last 10 to 15 years that the member states of UNESCO have not, not changed the process just really beyond what I'm showing you here. So I leave it there with some advertisements that uh, there'll be a Geoparks conference in Northern Finland in September. Also be one a few weeks later in Asia, in Japan, the Asia Pacific uh, Global Geoparks Network. Next year, um, there will be the seventh International UNESCO Conference on Geoparks in the United Kingdom at the English Riviera Global Geopark. And I'll just leave you with um, what we hope may happen this November, that UNESCO may well create its first new label, first new site label for over 40 years, UNESCO Global Geoparks, and all our members would be able to use the temple logo of UNESCO. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for this great presentation. Gracias a Patrick para esta presentación que es muy importante para todos nosotros. Hemos visto un poco de la historia de los geoparques, de la complementaridad de los geoparques con las otras medidas de la UNESCO, el patrimonio mundial y las reservas de biosfera. Hemos visto que el geoparque es muy importante, que no es solo un asunto de geología, es un asunto de encuentro entre los patrimonios de una comarca, su población para un desarrollo sostenible. Y hemos visto también la nueva situación y el futuro de los geoparques. Hemos pasado un poco de tiempo, pero si José Luis lo permite, considerando la, la importancia del tema, me gustaría proponeros de, de, de pasar cinco minutos con unas preguntas que podréis hacer al profesor Patrick McKeever. Sí, por favor. Thank you, and uh, pardon me. And, uh, we, we are a little bit in delay, but light is very important. Oh, yeah, Thank you for some, some, some questions. Thank you very much. Your presentation is splendid, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of it is so interesting, but two special things capture my eye. You mentioned that, uh, one, geoparks are not protected areas. Uh, second, you mentioned that many geoparks are in previous former mining areas and that uh, we be looking for sustainable uh, kind of uh, management of the area. Does that mean that uh, mining can be taking place in a geopark? Yes. Okay. Because we have a concept here in Mexico, as you will know, which is natural protected areas or reserves of the biosphere, and we don't allow any kind of a productive. Uh, yeah. In ge in ge well, in geoparks, we want to we want to be more realistic about how things how, about how society works, and rather than preventing extractive industries, we want to work with extractive industries okay. to encourage them to do things maybe in a more responsible, environmentally sustainable way. Great. But it's, it's important, I think, we're as geologists, we, we realize society can't exist without those activities. So we have to have, uh, we're trying to be more realistic about it. Thank you very much, Patrick. Otra pregunta?
Patrick. This is Enrique Espinosa from Mexican Geological Survey. Uh, well, you said that uh, a membership is accepted for four years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, after which each uh, geopark is strictly revised. But uh, uh, what happens? Uh, so it means that uh, a geopark could be rejected, could be invalidated yep. if it doesn't um, fit some uh, what, questions. What, what we have is a, an Excel spreadsheet called the evaluation form. It's a very detailed form. We ask information on everything you can imagine. Is the geological heritage not being damaged? How many um, people from the community are involved? Many jobs are created? How many visitors are coming? Are the visitors damaging the area? We ask everything in this form. It's a very, very strong quality control mechanism. And that's what we use to base whether the area will be renewed for another four years or maybe just for two years or whether we feel that it's gone so bad that we take the label off because it's the quality control for the geoparks is very important. And if one geopark slips up, it can create a bad image for UNESCO and a bad image for the rest of the global geopark. So that's the reason we have this process. Yeah. Una última pregunta, sí. Thank you. Dos últimas. I will uh, uh, to speak first in Spanish, to then I, I, I want to speak in English. Uh, la situación es que son reglas distintas por la evolución que ha venido teniendo el tema dentro de la UNESCO. Creo que es una cuestión que debemos de tener presente. Eh, la participación de los estados va a ser también distinta. Las, uh, las directrices que han sido aprobadas en el Consejo Ejecutivo en el pasado abril eh, son, son claras de cómo tiene que ser. Se mencionó justamente la participación de las comisiones nacionales y, e igualmente de los estados partes, de las, de las misiones permanentes de los estados acreditados ante la UNESCO. Esta no es una pregunta, sino ponerlo solamente en la mesa para tener claridad cómo va a haber una, un cambio de lo que eh, es el, el, um, actualmente el GGN con relación a lo que sería UNESCO Global Geoparks. So I, I'm going to try to explain in English. Uh, the thing is uh, that I see uh, different rules. So in the uh, executive board uh, in the last April, uh, it was accepted uh, the, the new guidelines. So for the state parties, it's going to be different. So you, you need to, to the approval from, from the maybe uh, national commissions so that's do not happen actually uh, uh, because maybe just the university or the, the, the experts present the project and 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 that's it and, and without the the approval for the states so if this is uh, correct that i'm saying i just to have clear this this part of the the situation that's Thanks. absolutely correct this is one of the changes that will have to happen because uh UNESCO Ge Global Geoparks will be part of an intergovernmental organization, UNESCO. So we have to respect the sovereignty of the member states. So all in future, all applications must come through either the National Commission or whichever, many countries don't have national commissions. So it's whichever government body has the link to UNESCO. Um, and in fact, this has actually been happening for many years anyway most of the geoparks actually do go through their body related to UNESCO, whether it's the National Commission. But this is now formalizing that. So this is now a compulsory, a compulsory change, yeah. Thank you very much. Hello, Patrick. What, what happens if, if uh, a proposed uh, geopark area coincides with uh, natural protected area or it is within the limits of it? Um, in, that, in that instance, the, the main thing is that, I mean, a geopark must have communities living inside. So it can't be a wilderness area. It has to have people. There have to be communities there. If the area coincides partially with a, a protected area, um, it's still okay. But we would want to see 
um, how the geopark and the authorities that run the protected area are going to work together. That's, that's important. And that's also the case, for example, if a geopark would coincide with uh, uh, a biosphere reserve or, or something like that. We want to actually have the agreement of the other party. We want to see a letter of agreement and we want to see an active um, plan of, of collaboration so that synergies are exploited rather than, than efforts being duplicated. That would be important. But we do have many geoparks that, for example, would include part of a national park or, or a nature park, something like that. But the geopark itself, the label's not, not, not there. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Well. De todas maneras, forma, yo veo que todos eh, tenéis muchas preguntas. Vamos a tener dos días para intercambiar y todo alrededor de los geoparques. So, uh, tendremos, uh, tenemos que seguir el programa, que somos un poco uh, de retraso. Y seguimos con uh, el profesor Nicolás Uroz.